I'm originally um, trained as a medical doctor. So I studied medicine, I attended hospital internship, then I started to practice as a general practitioner, as we call it GP or family doctor in other places they call it. After a few years, I realized that this is not what I studied for over two decades to become someone sitting in an office and prescribing over and over the same kind of pattern. Because normally people are coming to GPs to see them for flu and sickness or sometimes vaccination or um, some sort of infection. So I was dreaming of being in in a business or in a work related occupation more challenging so i decided to move on to australia to do a volunteer cancer research so i joined the team of uh, cancer research i did a couple of publications with them i got the scholarship and accepted to do a phd so end up doing a phd in genetics of cancer um, I've got my PhD in 2011 and the head of school felt like I'm a good teacher. So they asked me to join them in a teaching um, activity. So I become a lecturer, then promoted to senior lecturer. And now I'm associate professor in medical education. So I teach doctors of the future how to uh, be a good doctor uh, from examination skills, communications to molecular pathology or any aspect of pathology related to my discipline. Um, down the line, few years in education, I realized that it's quite competitive to go into cancer research or genetic research. And I was always curious to know about sex and how this thing is evolved in human beings. So, end up doing psychology at Monash University, which is one of the top universities in Australia. And I did um, my master in sexual health and sexology from the University of Sydney and um, then become a sexologist. And now I'm a clinical accredited sexologist in Australia and currently the president of the Australian Society of Sexologists, Queensland branch. Fascinating. So that's kind of my life journey, yes. And where are you from originally? I'm Persian from Iran. Oh, wow. Very yes. cool. Yeah, I have some good friends who are uh, from Iran. Yeah, talk about taboos and <laughs> limitations. Oh, yes. Yes, yeah. actually, that's very interesting. You know, um, let's talk about that. So you sure. you grew up in Iran. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. And it's, you know, let's say if we compare Iran to America, you know, it's very different with what is considered appropriate or allowed sexually. Yeah. How, what do you think it was that maybe opened you up to even wanting to explore or study this? Is this something that many people in or from your country do? Or did you kind of have to break some barriers to get here? I think because I was exposed to a lot of science-based, evidence-based, and medical material throughout my journey, I was always feeling I'm more capable of using my own brain rather than being dictated what is right or wrong. And this is probably something that I would like to talk about based on my psychology education, that human brain start evolving and accepting facts and truth from our childhood when we listen to our parents for example we start believing that um, stealing is bad or um, Jesus or Moses is the only one that can guide us through heaven or through the better future or a lot of things and if we grow up in a forest for example we might end up becoming a Robin Hood so there's this concept of sex and sexuality that has been prescribed to all of us not necessarily a specific culture that we believe this is true and it forms in us as a very young child or even a kid and start feeling and learning based on that so boys start getting their erection around age two or three and they get very excited and they feel like look i have a toy which is very pleasurable i play with it it gets hard it gets soft and it is very self-affirming and self-pleasing activity to realize that I like my sexual parts and I'm enjoying it. I know that it's 
somehow by the way that parents talk to them, it might be naughty, it might be my private part, but that's a good private part, and I like it. Girls, on the other hand, may not evolve in that age necessarily. At the time that they get a better sense of their sexuality, they are quite young and very sensitive. And the first thing they experience is a wound, an injury, a bleeding, a thing that they have to hide it. Use a tampon, use a pad, use it the way that is probably not necessarily a very welcoming experience. And that brings them to that kind of limitation around exploration of sexuality. And that's what I use normally in practice to help people to realize that if you feel some uncomfortness, if that's the term, around your sexuality, it's not necessarily happening because of you right now or because of what is happening in the dynamic of your relationship. It is more back to the history of how you grow up and how you understand and accept your sexuality. But I'm talking very black and white, male and female. And that was mostly what I have seen in culture like Persian from the past experience. And I have been in Australia for about 20 years now. But what I experienced in the first 20, 30 years of my life in uh, Islamic ex extremist society was more about boys, girls. These are bad. These are for after marriage. These things you, you never explore your fluidity. There wasn't even a conversation about gender fluidity. Then I realized there's a lot to more about it and something that is quite pleasant and rewarding for one individual become so concerning and so questionable in a culture. And probably that was the motivation for me to explore and get a better understanding of what's going on in our brain and why do we crave sex and compared to all the other mammals, we're doing it quite often comparatively. It's not just a breeding season event. So it's not just procreation event. It's more of a pleasurable experience. And that's um, drove me to this point that now I'm running a course about pleasure, or I call it rethink pleasure in my practice to help people to understand why pleasure is important rather than thinking of your performance, your act of manhood or your gender role or expectation that has been guided, advised, or delivered to you throughout your life. So that's where about I'm at right now. Fascinating. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with me. It's it's really interesting how you kind of followed this path. And it sounds like you've always kind of been your own thinker and, you know, questioning things for yourself and wondering why is the culture this way when I, it sounds like you were almost maybe be able to make that distinction. Like you, you realized you were sexual, but you also realized that your culture was saying it's not good to be sexual. Sexuality mm. is only okay under these circumstances mm -hmm. that you kind of, was, you were trying to maybe find that the disconnect between the two yeah. yeah yeah exactly and being being a therapist for a couple of years now and I, australia is a very multicultural country i have seen many people from many different backgrounds and they're not that different they might not just follow a spiritual path to it but we are always getting to that point that i can conclude is lack of education so the weakness of the educational system in teaching our kids how to be sexual, how to be appreciative of, of it, how to um, acknowledge their presence in a consensual, in a safe way, will make the whole universe be different. Fascinating. Yeah. All of us everywhere in the world, it seems like, unless, like you said, you really have that foundation and you've been trained to embrace your sexuality, there's still a discomfort with it. Would you say that that is the result of just lack of proper education all over the world? Because it seems like this issue exists everywhere in the world in varying yeah. forms. Yeah, absolutely. With, with everything related to sex, I believe there is a huge gap because when it comes to education and when it's time to educate someone to learn it correctly, we are so uncomfortable or insecure to pass that wisdom that we might have or ask someone who is a sex educator to teach our kids about it. And that 
lack of education make people to be blank about the topic. So they enter to relationship or they enter to understanding or becoming judgmental when it's beyond or besides their social norm or their cultural acceptance. And that taboo that is built in those um, younger individual keep staying with them. They're not being changed because they form in that young age that I mentioned, they accept and believe. And one of the opportunities that I got in education was to build an LGBTI allyship course for medical practitioners or health practitioners in general. And it is about not just being inclusive and respectful and using proper pronouns and language, which is quite often you see in most organizations around the world. It's about the proper question to ask a transgender man. Do you ask about how's your prostate health or do you offer them a pelvic exam? Is it about what we used to call pap smear? It's called cervical smear exam. So you need to have that level of understanding as a health practitioner to be capable of offering the proper, safe, and inclusive um, environment for your patient, regardless of uh, the, the, their gender or the identity that they chose to be. That misinformation or lack of comprehensive education, which is always a question mark in many cultures and society, make people to go get misinformation, confusion, feeling that discomfort with them throughout their life. And then they will definitely start criticizing um, platforms like Jasmine that people are enjoying themselves, having a consensual relationship, helping others who are probably benefit mentally, emotionally, or just for the entertainment part of it, of the service that is, to be honest, none of anyone's business. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's also another big point is that where I think we might be too much in each other's business these days. Yeah, yeah exactly. This, this level of criticism doesn't make sense because it does have an access permission. It does have age restriction. You need to have all the boxes ticked. You need to get the consent. You need to offer their consent. And then the interaction will build and the, the value of this structure, I have reviewed that for a while to see what it is about, is that if you're stuck at home and if you're lonely and if you have that level of... um disconnect from your society or your um, family or the group of people who are able to support you or give you the comfort or to be just the ear to listen, then instead of being anxious, ne nervous, depressed, breakdown, you have a way to communicate. And that communication is not necessarily always about sex and sexy. It can be just a conversation to explore more of that sense of belonging, that uh, existential issue that I'm still alive, I still exist, I can see someone, I can communicate with them. And the good part is that that person can get naked for me. That person can guide me to something. Maybe I have some confusion. Where should I do what? Or where should I put something? It has a, an educational value to it attached as well to maybe sometimes break down that social norm that you might carry over to say, oh, I didn't realize that. A lot of male clients that I have who are coming to my practice for therapy are completely unaware about their prostate, the sensation around it, the touch around it, the exploration of the body. We are very skin hungry people technically speaking, from the time that we were born, we spent probably a few years of the early age with parents and on their skin. And we call it in Australia, kangaroo care. When you get a premature baby, they put it on the skin of their parents, mother or father for hours. And they are discharged from the hospital faster. That's the important of skin touch. And I'm not talking about just the hippie aspect of the skin touch. It's proven by immune response to saliva that these kids, these premature kids can be discharged better and faster and healthier. And that's because of that skin touch. But when we grow up older, kissing and touching and cuddling become a celebration of Christmas, become a birthday present, become when we get an award. So we are losing that connection with our skin, with our touch, 
and COVID aside, nowadays we don't like people to be very near to us. We feel uncomfortable when we are paying for our groceries. If someone is just behind us, I was like, give me some space. This is us. And that is when you get engaged with some sexual activity, your focus is going to be on your performance. Am I hard? Am I in? Am I out? Is he happy? Is she happy? Am I doing it right? But I wish I could do it better. I wish I make more sound in it. These are irrelevant questions when you don't see yourself as a sexual being rather than comparing yourself with just a tiny amount of sex organ that you might have. Yes, so miseducation, bad education, misinformation, all of those are the reason of being criticizing, critical about things that are not just normally sits in our cultural norm or societal norm and become a taboo. I have a, an interesting story. It's probably about 10 years now. It was fresh when I started doing that. My medical student in about 2014, in an exam question wrote, one of the cause of acne, the pimples on the face, masturbation. I know they were joking, but they were like five out of 200. So that means we are not just joking, joking, we heard it from someone. So when we treat masturbation as something instead of self-pleasurable, self-appraisal activity and call it a taboo, call it a bad thing, call it something that you lose your hair, you lose your eyesight, you get acne, and it still exists. I'm talking about 21st century. They, at least they know the joke. So that is something well, that was interesting for me to say. Are you friend with your penis? Are you friend with your clitoris or not? You need to be friend with yourself first to have that exciting and rewarding experience in your intimate life and intimate relationship. I know it's a little bit off track of the Jasmine concept, but no, no. yeah. Not at all. Yeah, actually, it's completely on track um, okay. for the interview. Yeah, this is, we really want these interviews to be informative and educational, yeah. you know, more than anything. So I want to ask you, so was that a real misconception or belief that if you masturbate, you were developing acne or you said losing your eyesight or your hair? Were those real beliefs? Yeah, I think I think it's probably not for your age range, but I remember, and there are movies that you can see sometimes they're talking about it. I don't know if you have seen Malina about World War II story. Um, they were just shouting, like, if you keep masturbating every night, you will lose, you go blind. So it's kind of like um, a common understanding. And I think it was back to very ancient history of masturbation and the way that um, we were trying to control society and we had that kind of guidance to enjoy in a pattern or in a way that we dictate you rather than you just go self-explore your way. And masturbation was one of the biggest taboo in many cultures and many societies, American, Australian, Persian, Asian, they're all the same about masturbation and it's still some kind of uh, discomfort in individuals to feel like I don't necessarily feel like I want to masturbate and I know it's not that big a deal but I feel uncomfortable because I have that history carried over in my mindset same as stealing is bad so if you have been prescribed that and if it's in now in your um, unconscious brain then you always have that challenge in your head about this member and model on live jasmine sometimes will create this insane bond that is still going 15 years later i mean chatting every day and i'm i'm like what is this phenomena how is this happening and i know it has to do obviously with communication because that's the main that's the only interaction they have is chatting talking and sure, there's video calls, but do you think that there's something about maybe feeling safe when you can just talk so openly or sexually with someone? Or what is it about communication and how they're doing it that is 
creating these relationships that last for 15, 20 years. Mm. Um, I, I think part of it is because it has that consensual aspect of a relationship and that point of that relationship that is clear. I'm not earning money to pay for bills and you go to work and pay for car loan or any kind of conversation like that. We are friends. This friendship that forms is kind of like forming a bond of emotional transactions. So I talk about my day, you talk about your day. It's probably sitting in that area of feeling more comfortable. The beauty of relationship and that social um, platform or in Jasmine would be there won't be criticism, there won't be expectation and judgment. So you can actually share your fantasies with, without feeling uncomfortable because I've seen most couples are having dreams and having fantasies, but they feel uncomfortable. Um, and the question is, how can I reveal that? And I will say, go back to day one when you start communicating because the whole element of a healthy relationship is understanding a proper sexual communication language and that understanding and that communication language is formed better in jasmine because it is about that aspect of human being that they're exploring and with that aim or with that hope they feel more comfortable to open up and there is a back and forth rewarding experience that you will say i like that person She's offering me some advice. She's listening to me. She's not judging me. And if I say I use a vibrator on myself, it's kind of like, all right, it's not any criticism or stigma around it. But if I share that, for example, with my partner, it might be uncomfortable. Or suddenly, when, where does that come from? So that that expectation that you see uh, from a relationship or from a person-to-person -person relationship in a physical aspect won't happen in that virtual environment. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. There's, It sounds like what you're saying is the dynamic is just set up mm -hmm. for that level of vulnerability and safe yeah, yeah. To, to be vulnerable in that way. What are your thoughts on fantasies? Overall, things that are happening in your brain and in your mind, the way that you like it, without any taboo, without any restriction, with being very, very naughty, all of that are categorized in your fantasy and dreams. It doesn't necessarily have to follow any recipe towards what is normal for you. So your fantasy might be having sex with a monster. It might be having dreams or things related. I'm just going extreme with that because I have heard many different fantasies around and they just keep checking with me, say, am I mentally okay? Is that normal to have this? And I say, absolutely okay. Your fantasies are all okay because there are something that is boiled and cooked in your head. And it doesn't mean anything to say, I need it. Or I am now suddenly deciding that maybe I am not a straight or I'm not gay anymore. It doesn't mean anything when you think that I have a fantasy. That's just a kind of taste that you're building up in your exploration of the excitement. That makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. I'm curious, you know, taking it a layer deeper, you mentioned it doesn't really matter what the fantasy is. It's kind of mm. fulfilling some underlying need, basically. Yeah. Where does that come from? Did did it happen in childhood? Where are we born with it? What are your thoughts? Um, I'm not sure. It's probably an area that I'm not that much into these days from the line of practice. You normally pick the topics that make you tickle or explore it or feel like I'm curious to know more about this one or that one but um, human sexuality is a very very broad and very very various types so you have a lot of um, steps and a lot of phases in your life that you are start exploring and getting to the point from 
the time that you become more of um, your phase of adulthood, you start getting excited and you understand that you like sex and you enjoy sex. But beside that, you will maybe compete with your peers to say, oh, my friend had 15 times, I haven't done that many, or she has 12 boyfriends, I only have 10. These are like the exploration of that phase. Later on, you're thinking about maybe more of a settling relationship, maybe more of an intimate connection. A lot of middle-aged stage is about connection, about being intimate, not necessarily thinking about all the humpy, pumpy, sweaty action. It's just about cuddling, touching, acknowledging. If you are cooking, if I'm washing, if I'm preparing a meal, if I'm lawn, mowing the lawn, you just acknowledge my presence in that relationship. So these are all part of our intimacy. One aspect of that um, curiosity and exploration of my sexual being would be that imagination aspect of things that are sometimes so bad and sometimes so naughty and sometimes so wrong, but it's just a fantasy that you have. So um, you might see things or you might experience things that may make you excited or make you just feel disgusted, but it's still happening in your head and it doesn't have any meaning to say, what's going on? I need to do it. So if you're having a fantasy of a um, sex with multiple people, doesn't mean that you actually crave for it. It's just that fantasy in your head. Putting it into action is probably walking to the steps of uh, tasting that kind of fantasy into reality but not everyone wants to definitely make all their fantasies or all the dreams come true the same way that you might dream of one night being a batman or catwoman you don't suddenly jump off the roof tomorrow you know the level of um, safety and the level of possibility of making things true yeah that makes sense yeah I have a workshop coming very soon, examination of reproductive system. We don't say sexual organ or sex. It's kind of like that initiation of the topic. And that's creating that confusion either for Jasmine members or for general public. The sex organ designed to make babies. Yeah. That's the only purpose of it. It is the same with apes, monkeys, dolphins, any kind of animal that you can think of. The beauty that human being explored was at very ancient, ancient age, they realized that, oh, something is happening in my procreative activity and make me excited and has a very pleasant feeling. I produce dopamine, endorphin, oxytocin, a lot of other teen in my system that tell me good job do it again and maybe tomorrow not next year because breathing season in mammals at least happen probably like once in a year so you have sex today you have sex another year when the season is right when the fruits are around when the weather is right and you know you have your cave and your tent or whatever you do in in ancient ancient history but then we realize that this rewarding experience is making me feel happy, making me feel connected, making me feel part of that society. And they start exploring around. So they have sex on top of a tree, in the river, in the next town, in the neighbor's cave, all over the place. Then societal norm dictates things because you can't have America constantly having sex, everyone with everyone. So there are some norms, some morality, some policies has been written either call it matrimonial or religion or spiritual or whatever it is to keep the society balanced and intact. And I think at, at the earlier age, it was more about I give you grains and I make wheat and I make you to have bread, you give me babies. So it become more of a transaction between men and women to be under the same roof. But Later on, when we are expanding to billions, then there are like demand for some norms and some policies and all of those. So when people are asking about sexual health, I will say, um, and especially I will say that to people who think 
that they like to say, ah, maybe I want to be asexual. And that asexuality means someone who's not thinking about sex or who's not that much passionate about sex, but they might still have masturbation, but they don't want to interact sexually with someone else. And I say, okay, that's all good. That's all accepted, but don't ignore your sex organ because that will give you that sense, that drive of being alive. So I think sex or sexual health is when you feel happy, when you feel alive, and when you feel satisfied with things that are happening in and around you with your sexuality, if that makes sense. So you can be sexually happy by having a couple of times masturbation a day. You can be happy by having sex with a couple of different individuals. You can be happy by just living with your partner, your husband or your wife. So it's completely a descriptive measure that we just put it into our norms that we are thinking okay so the who description of sexual health is talking about consent and individual and safe sex and all those stuff but what about pleasure it has to be pleasurable it has to be something that you enjoy it doesn't need to be orgasmic it has to be telling you that i like it maybe we should do it again <laughs> or maybe i should do it again with myself so this is like more of a reality of sex the 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 thing that i like to see in individual and i'm trying to put it in my practice and into my guidance in the therapy is that when you put your body in coma for example in an icu and hopefully or luckily if you're awake after a month they won't let you go because your muscles are weak your joints are forgetful you can't walk you can't balance you need control back to normal so there is a lot of rehabilitation physiotherapy and all sorts of stuff happening to make you to be back to your norm if you ignore your sex your sexuality your sex department your sex organ your reproductive system whatever and at what stage that you want to accept my words whatever you call it if you ignore it you put it in coma if your relationship with your partner is bitter for 20 years you can't expect your penis to be erect. You can't expect to enjoy sex. You can't expect to be wet. You need to start practicing that appreciation of an organ. We eat salad because we don't like to get bowel cancer. We go to the gym because we want happy heart, we happy lung. We don't smoke because it, we know that it might give you cancer. Every morning you wake up and look at the mirror because you like to take care of your appearance. The only thing that we're really good at ignoring is our sex organ. Okay. Yes. Hopefully that answers sexual health question. Yes, I think that that's a great definition. I think a lot of people are going to appreciate that because in some ways it gave permission to focus on pleasure. Mm. And I think sometimes people forget that that is a very important part of it. I like how you even told the story of our evolution, you know, mm. where it was just reproductive, but then we realized, wait a minute, it's also giving pleasure. And yeah. that became a priority. Yeah. I'm curious, you know, in all of your, your time in your career, it's, it sounds like it's been quite a long career. Um, <laughs> is there any piece of research that you've seen that just really stood out to you as really interesting or fascinating? I think all of it is fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> sex is fascinating. Yes, if, yes. Normally a sexologist or a person in any health discipline who is drive to become a sexologist is fascinated by sex and how strange and how variations are working in there and how the more you learn and the more you explore, the more you realize, oh, didn't know that. Oh, I want to learn more about this. So yes, every part of um, the science of sexual medicine and sexology is fascinating. There are a number of research that I'm interested in and working on around um, the benefit of self-pleasure and the advantage of it in your sexual well-being and in your general well-being. And it's talking more about 
how your breathing, your mental health, your cardiovascular system will start feeling more um, young and youth and available. And you can be 80 and still enjoying that pleasurable experience by yourself or with a toy or with your partner. And that is good enough to make you feel like I'm still on earth and I'm still connected and I'm still wanted and I am still enjoying life. And this is interesting to see, for example, when they start forming the habit of masturbation and they start thinking, oh, it's not good, it's not good, it's not good, to give them that idea, you can actually reduce the chance of prostate cancer if you masturbate a lot. So it's kind of like a good message you see in articles or papers when you see that. The, the area that I'm working these days is more about the educational aspect of so, um, sexuality, and I'm specifically focused on the LGBTI, LGBTQI plus allyship in health disciplines. I'm also working with cancer survivorship and their sexuality and the body image issues around it. Wow, yeah. I mean, that's really, yeah, that's really important work. What are the consequences, if any, of us not really exploring our sexuality? Mm. That's, that's the whole point of why we are having sex and how important it is and how rewarding it could be. Um, but to answer to the first part of your question i have to say it is definitely and it is a sad part of this that when you are surviving you think that i don't deserve it and you start thinking because i lost my breast now i'm not sexy or i don't deserve to think about sex and that is all because of the the way that we are described in our gender in our role in our um expectations of what a sexual being means and that is the sad part of it because it doesn't matter what people are thinking or looking or expecting it's about you and you to accept that you're still a person alive with all your systems and organs they all deserve attention and they all deserve to live and that's what we are trying to understand that why that happened and how to help them to experience that it doesn't matter if you're feeling dry because of a chemotherapy you can still enjoy using lubricants you can still enjoy using pills and medicine to help you to remind you that do you enjoy watching netflix you must enjoy other parts do you enjoy eating food you must still enjoy everything so it's kind of like that understanding in a person because we are always drive by things that we see in media or by the things that has been with us for many, many, many years. And I'm talking about a person who is in their 70s. It's really hard to understand that, okay, what does it mean if I can't have an erection? Because when they do a prostate um, surgery, sometimes there is no other way to remove prostate without damaging nerves. And when that happened, the penis is not getting an erection. But that doesn't mean that you can still feel it or you can still enjoy being sexually alive and active. So that's the tricky part that science and medicine start to exploring. And there are always progress and development with that. And um, if someone is listening and sitting in that category, they are actually urologists who are able to help people to have a prosthetic implant in their penis so it will be erect and giving them that sense if that's the only concern they have because as i mentioned when you learn something before you're 20 or 23 or 28 that sits in your brain forever and you can't accept anything else this is my the struggle in my lgbti course because if i have a 60 year old surgeon who is the head of the department and well-respected surgeon but he has homophobic idea and thought i'm not able to change that person he lived in that culture and in that mindset for 60 years they become inclusive they attend courses they get their badge and their cvs updated and everything but with a few glasses of whiskey you will see that they become racist homophobic and all this stuff so you need to start early but 
um, getting back to people who are um, surviving a cancer event, that doesn't mean that they don't deserve to have sex. And that's the big argument or challenge that they are facing. And my research is more about how can I help you with that challenge and how can you just get back on track? Our sexual drive as the underlying yeah. focus, pleasure or connection, which one do you find is usually more dominant? Uh, both, many things. Sometimes it's none. We might have sex just because we're tired. We might have sex because we're angry. We might have sex because we want to sleep. There, there are a lot of things that we like sex and we, we might enjoy sex. Sometimes it's dopamine producing. Sometimes it's endorphin producing. And sometimes it's oxytocin. Oxytocin is that love hormone that you have. So you like that touch part of it. You love that connection part of it. There's a lot of oxytocin. When I see my partner orgasming, it doesn't mean that I will have an orgasm. It's just giving me that sense of happiness, that sense of love. And um, the, the, the problem as a sex therapist that we see is that that become more dominant to say I'm more into that act, that performance, rather than thinking I like it and I enjoy things that are happening in me. I'm constantly focused on how I'm doing it, how am I delivering a service. And that kind of service delivery approach to sex is the main cause of problem. Yeah, but yeah, pleasure, definitely. Um, connection is a must but you don't expect to have that kind of connection all the time especially with social media or platform like Jasmine you might think like well I'm sitting behind a computer or on my phone so I don't have that much of physical interaction that kind of touch interaction with you I enjoy chatting with you I enjoy talking with you I enjoy learning from you asking you to do things all all in all are good but there's a little bit of um, non-verbal language that we see with our partners or with our friends that would probably be missing in that social media aspect or that virtual relationship aspect. There's a little bit of disconnect when you don't feed all your five senses and five is touch. So you see things, you smell things, you touch things, you taste things and these all get together to give you that what I call mindful presence. So when you want to enjoy sex, you may you need to be sure that you're actually mindfully present there. Instead of thinking, when I'm finished with sex, I'm going to submit my assignment, or when I'm finished, I have to pay my taxes or move my car. These are all distractors in your head that will you might still, when especially when you're younger, you might still enjoy sex. But when you get older, you might experience that why am I losing my erection in the middle of sex? It's because you're not mindfully there. So this is the same thing. You will enjoy that company with um, models. And it is a very fulfilling experience to keep your mind and mental health balanced, to explore a lot of different things. But you might be also mindful that you need a little bit of touch. You need a little bit of taste and smell, things that are part of your being to say that I'm enjoying it. I, I really like the the point you made of being mindfully there um, mm -hmm. because it almost, and being really present and not thinking about moving your car or paying the light bill or whatever the case is, <laughs> but you know, it, it, you didn't use this word, but it almost suggests it, it gives sex back a level of, um, Dignity almost mm. like being present there, you know, yeah. it's not just an act like this is something big <laughs> to be present mm. for and to do mindfully. Mm. And um, yeah, it just kind of puts it back in, in its honor. I, I, I appreciated that. If I gave you a microphone that everyone in the world would hear and you could tell them one thing about sex or sexuality that you don't think the world is quite getting yet, but you wish they did, what would it be? I think I mentioned it in my earlier word <laughs> that you need to be mindfully present to enjoy a very happy sexual experience, either by yourself or with a partner or in an orgy. 
if you are criticizing, if you are thinking, if you are what we call it, expectatoring, if you're looking at yourself, how do I look? Do I smell? Do I feel well? Am I big? Am I small? Am I in? Am I out? All these conversations is causing that thing that we call performance anxiety. When you are anxious about something, you are not there. And I wish all my clients and all people who are listening <laughs> understand that if you're good at cooking, it's because you smell things that you're cooking and you know when it's burning. You taste it to make sure that it's not too salty or too sweet. You look at it because you know what level of brown you like in that sugar melting. You touch things and you know if it's hot or if it's cold. And overall, you pre prepare yourself with that. There, there's also sound that will say, is it boiling? Is it not boiling? Is it getting there? Not? Five senses are alive and you're a good chef or a good cook because you learn that by practice to be mindfully present in your kitchen. Same goes with driving, same go with surfing, same go with sitting in an office answering an e email. If your brain is not doing things mindfully, you won't be as competent as you are in your art or your trade. Sex is the same. If you want to have a good sex, be there for sex. Forget about being fat, being skinny, being tall, being short, being big, being not big. It doesn't matter when you are there. I think that's so amazing. beautifully said, beautifully <laughs> said. And, and I think that that when you can let all those things go and be present and that is, you know, some people get blissed out. I mean, that's the whole point of an orgasm. It really can take you to a point of bliss. And I think that that's part of it. Like if you've engaged so deeply that you are able to reach the bliss point, you know, you've done it right. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. and that's, that's almost, I mean, that's, I'm sure a whole other topic, but for some people that's very spiritual and, um, yeah, I, I think very well said. Mm. I, I, I wish people would realize that at some point that the orgasm is not as important as your journey mm. because orgasm is few seconds. Yes. It's delicious. It's pleasurable. It's a boost of all those together. But when you put that as your destiny and you just target that, you're wasting a whole journey. If you are walking in Europe or going by a train, you will say, I like to see Rome. I like to see Paris. I like to go to other places. I like the coffee shop. I like this. I like that. Before reaching London. If you put London as your target, you forget about all the things that you saw it's a big waste. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And what a metaphor for so many things in life. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that, that could be applicable to, you know, career goals, but Hey, like, look at what you're doing now and enjoy the journey and be there. Don't just think about this pinnacle you have in your mind, you know, think about the building blocks to get there. And yeah. of course, sexuality. And of course, that's a great, lesson and analogy for life which is yeah the journey i think that that might be a saying it's about the journey yeah. not the destiny yeah. but thank you so much this has been my a pleasure. great interview absolutely my pleasure <laughs> thanks for inviting me and i hope i answered a couple of those questions that you were curious to know my insight or opinion absolutely um i I think I make myself to be more in the department of pleasure and the value of pleasure in relationship because um, over many years of practice as a doctor or as an educator or as a therapist, I see that people are very focused on things that are not relevant. And that's why my message was about mindfulness, being present and not thinking about just the destiny, enjoy the journey. And the rethink pleasure that I'm trying to develop is to give people that understanding that every step of your life is a pleasurable experience from the time that you are giving yourself a massage or a bubble bath to the time that you have that self-pleasurable, exciting experience. That is just the only term that I see in English dictionary as being masturbation, which has that gravity or taboo with it. It's just a self-pleasurable exciting experience maybe i should come up with an acronym but 
when you do that, when you start reading literature, when you go into erotica, when you start exploring your fantasy, when you learn how to communicate with someone, then you start experiencing that all of it is about pleasure. It's not any goal in it, any destiny in it, and I can enjoy and be as orgasmic as I want by being in every phase of it. I was recently reading an article in Journal of Sexual Medicine um, about people who can have orgasm actually by through their elbow and their knees without even engaging their sexual parts. And that is telling me how interesting and fascinating the human brain is and how capable we are if we are mindfully there. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. This has been fascinating. Pleasure. And um, yeah, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. I enjoy chatting with you and um, hearing your questions that are really interesting to make me think. Good. Uh, <laughs> you have to put your brain together and say, okay, so how should I say it in the right way? You probably have like audience from all parts of the world and you need to address any different cultures that might listen to it so I'm not in, uh, necessarily just targeting something specific so it's like a spirituality culture religion parents whatever it is just learn a little bit more for your benefit yeah absolutely absolutely